Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Penn Museum. Um, I know I'm a strange face on this podium. Um, my name is Dan Rahimi. I'm executive director here at the museum, responsible for our galleries. And Steve Tinney normally takes this podium to introduce our speakers, and I always sit and listen and, and admire how clever he is. So I won't be clever in my introduction. I'll be straightforward, but I, I am thrilled to be able to welcome you here tonight. This is the penultimate presentation of Great Myths and Legends. Ah, this is the penultimate um, presentation in, in our series, Great Myths and Legends. And, and in June, on June 1st, you can hear Dr. Paul Cobb speak on Arabian Nights, medieval fantasy, and modern forgery. Um, but tonight, we, we have a treat, because here at, at Penn, you know, here at the museum, we're a museum of archaeology and anthropology. But we have very broad tentacles. We reach out all across the museum community and the university community. And we draw on many fields of expertise that, that are naturally associated with us. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Jeremy McInerney, is the Davidson Kenny Professor of Classical Studies here at the University of the Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, and a, a close colleague of ours at the museum. Dr. McInerney has broad ranging interests in the classical world, literary, historical and archaeological. And the titles of two of his books, I was just looking up recent publications of his, are, are reveal this, I think. Uh, one of them is The Folds of Parnassos, Land, of, Land and, Eth and Ethnicity in Ancient Focus. And another one was The Cattle of the Sun, Herding and Sanctuaries in Ancient Greece. So you can get a sense of, of a variety of interests and not strictly literary, quite, quite broad. He has written numerous articles and encyclopedia entries on everything from ancient ethnicity to the funerary inscriptions of ancient Rome to the wonderful question, did Theseus slay the Minotaur? His topic tonight, though, is different. You all know it. It's warrior women, Amazons, and the Greek imagination. Uh, he'll speak in a moment. After this, the talk, there will be questions, and there are microphones here in the aisle, so please come up to the microphone with your questions, and now join me in welcoming um, Dr. McInerney. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. When people ask me how to pronounce the name, which is a little difficult for many people, um, I often say, if you um, ever watched um, Sesame Street, you remember there are two characters, Bert and Ernie. You just make the first one into Mac. <laughs> huh? yeah, think about it. I'm sorry, I should have told you, yeah. No, no, it's, uh, it's just to make it easy for you. Sorry, just a technological pause for a moment. Let me get this all up and running. This evening, I'd like to take a look at the Amazons, those remarkable warrior women known to us from Greek mythology, and among the most enduring of the legacies left us by the Greeks in our own artistic and imaginative repertoire. Because there is no doubt that we still entertain ourselves with the fantasy of the warrior woman. From Sigourney Weaver in the Alien movies to more recently the very Amazonian Katniss Everdeen played by Jennifer Lawrence. And just so that we're entirely clear, the warrior woman is not exclusively Greek or even Western. She's a figure who crops up in a number of cultures. I use this for the very simple reason that Mulan is my daughter's favorite movie. It's a good movie to bond with your daughter with, I, I, I promise you. Now, we could spend an entire evening just discussing the contemporary versions of the Amazon story, but, which I'm not going to do, but I do want to suggest that some of the recent pop culture manifestations of the story of the warrior woman might help us to understand the Greeks a little better and vice versa. So, playing in cinemas, right now, as a matter of fact, is a movie called Batman vs. Superman that boasts the presence of a character 
who is openly and not even metaphorically, dare I say literally, an Amazon, the figure of Wonder Woman, played by the Israeli actress Gal Gadot. Wonder Woman is a character who was introduced into the comic universe, the comic world of the 1940s, uh, as a new superhero in the DC universe. And her origins are very interesting. An American psychologist by the name of William Marston proposed in 1943 that what American culture needed, and more specifically what American girls needed, was a healthy role model. Influenced by Jungian notions of archetypes, he opined, not even girls want to be girls so long as our feminine archetype lacks force, strength and power. Not wanting to be girls, they don't want to be tender, submissive, peace-loving, as good women are. <laughs> Women's strong qualities have become despised because of their weakness. The obvious remedy is to create a feminine character with all the strength of Superman, plus all the allure of a good and beautiful woman. What he... <laughs> you knew it was coming, all right? Yeah, it gets worse. When he <laughs> what he proposed was a princess whose origins lay in Greek stories of the Amazons. Diana Prince, as she was called when living among us lesser mortals, uh, was the semi-divine daughter, is the semi-divine daughter, she's divine for heaven's sakes, of Queen Hippolyta from the island of Themyscira. Armed with the lasso of truth, indestructible bracelets, and the most awesome go-go boots since Goldie Horn, <laughs> Wonder Woman is an American Amazon. There are a couple of elements, however, in Marston's description that really deserve closer attention here, and these will be valuable to keep in mind as we deal with the Greeks. This is why I'm beginning with the pop culture references, because I think there's actually a, a, a vector here. What Marston was giving us, really, was an Amazon who, at one level, is clearly a projection of a feminist idea of an empowered woman. At the same time, it is also, very clearly, a male heterosexual projection, answering the question, how do we make the kind of woman that we want, and when I say we, I mean heterosexual men, loving, submissive, pliant, yet powerful, sexually confident, and alluring. Now, do these seem contradictory, or at least difficult to reconcile? Yes. <laughs> Jill Lepore, who has written a wonderful and scholarly treatment of Wonder Woman, I'm not here, <laughs> uh, has written, quote, feminism made Wonder Woman. But she also notes the burden of this image, saying, and then Wonder Woman remade feminism, which hasn't always been good for feminism. Well, I don't know. I mean, is it too much to expect a woman to work a 40-hour week, bring home a paycheck, do the housework, raise the kids, help them with their homework, and put a fully cooked meal on the table every night, and then come to bed looking like a Barbie doll? <laughs> Call me old-fashioned, I don't know. The serious point that I'm trying to make here is that gender issues are always very messy. So as you look at this, ask yourself a simple question. Does this empower your daughter or does it objectify her while inculcating impossible ideals of physical attractiveness? Any image or symbol that does some cultural work by helping us to give voice to our fears, and our yearnings, our desires, and our misgivings is not likely to yield to a single one-dimensional reading. Throughout the 90s, for example, one of the most popular shows on TV was Xena, Warrior Princess, starring the startlingly Amazonian Lucy Lawless. They breed them really big in New Zealand, which is where she's from. <laughs> Xena and her offsider became gay icons in the lesbian community, and yet you can still read entire Wikipedia articles, 
that won't even use the L word in relation to their relationship. So we're going to have to use some finesse in tackling the Amazons to work out what they really signify. One strategy might be to take the historian's approach and simply to ask if there ever were any Amazons. And the answer, reassuringly, is yes. In the 19th century and earlier, reports reached Europe from explorers in Africa of the extraordinary kingdom of Dahomey in modern-day Benin in northwest Africa, where royal armies often included contingents of elite female warriors. And the battle cry of one of these women was recorded when she was an old, old woman by an ethnographer who... Uh, he, it's an amazing episode. She's very, very old. She's walking along the street, hunched over, and someone um, makes a noise that sounds like the clicking of a, the, the bolt of a, of a rifle, and she instantly goes into warrior mode. And even as an old, old woman, she rolls over in the street and starts chanting this cry after going through the motion of cocking her, 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 her rifle and shooting the enemy. The blood flows, you are dead. The blood flows, we have won. The blood flows, it flows, it flows, the blood flows, the enemy is no more. Some of the reports are, of course, as lurid as you would expect of these colonial ethnographies, but they're not entirely fictitious. There really were royal guards of warrior women in Africa. What about the ancient world? Well, I'm going to give a qualified yes, although I'll say right now, the evidence is not nearly as straightforward. So you have to bear with me while I do a little excursus to set this up. Excavations in the 1990s and the early 2000s in areas as far afield as Bulgaria, Kazakhstan and Siberia had begun to shed light on the various nomadic cultures of the steppes, the vast area ranging from the Black Sea to Mongolia. These excavations often of burial mounds or kurgans dating to the first millennium BC are allowing us to get a better view of the many nomadic peoples who did not employ writing and who are known to us from the literary records of the Greeks and the Romans as Scythians. So please note, for the most part, we don't even know what these people called themselves. These excavations raise, excuse me, that comment about not knowing their name raises a cautionary note from the very start. Some scholars, uncomfortable with the idea that we should use names derived from Herodotus, a Greek source, prefer to use names supplied by archaeology, pit grave culture, syntashta culture, Paziric culture. And that's fine, provided we recognize that we're simply substituting our designations for Herodotus's designations. We are not reclaiming their own cultural identity. It's a big lead up for a very ordinary slide. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> If you work on PowerPoints, you can get a little bit crazy with the bells and whistles until you realize it's just a map. No, it's not just a map. As ever, our tools for describing these are inadequate. I show you a map of the Eurasian continent, and this evokes connotations of states such as the various stands, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, and so forth with clearly delineated boundaries, but rather what we're actually talking about is a significant zone of cultural interaction all across Central Asia. People ranged widely over these steppe lands, moving their herds from lowlands in the winter to highlands in the summer. In fact, not surprisingly, recent work on the domestication of the horse points to three or four episodes occurring exactly along this corridor. This may not be very clear, but this map, replicated here as well, is extending from the Mediterranean here up into northern Europe and across here through the steppe lands of Russia all the way across into Siberia and Mongolia. So this is the Eurasian continent, okay? More land up here to the north, 
Iran and Central Asia here to the south. But these are the steppe lands that we refer to. And as you can see, it's now postulated that there are four different domestication events going on precisely within that corridor because that's where continuously humans and horses are interacting. They're using the same steppe lands, the same grasslands. We city dwellers are used to a world of cities and states with borders. But if we were nomadic herders, and then after domestication, horsemen too, we would see Eurasia totally differently. And to really make this point, let me simply compare these two pieces. These are quite extraordinary. The one up here on the right comes from Siberia in 500 BC. This one, which is essentially the same kind of figure as you can see, comes from Northern Europe and dates to about 400 AD. This international animal style, as it's sometimes referred to, therefore covers a span of over 3,000 miles and at least a millennium of history. So there is massive movement of culture through this area, but it doesn't leave written records, which means that for people who work in the Greek and Roman Mediterranean, it's been largely ignored. We don't have literary sources. There is a lot about these cultures we're only just beginning to learn. Now, in that world of nomads that I've been describing for you that extends literally from the edge of Europe right across to Siberia and Mongolia, in that world of nomads, it now looks as if women were frequently honored and enjoyed very high status. For example, in 1993, a Pazirik Kurgan was excavated in Siberia and brought to light the mummy of a woman who died in the 5th century BC, between the age of 20 and 30. She was buried with her horses and her body exhibited, as you can see here, the tattoos associated with the highest ranking members of society. This is actually her left shoulder and that's the design that uh, was tattooed onto her arm. Now what makes, and this is a reconstruction based on her skull, what makes study of this material so difficult aside from poor resources for conservation, illegal excavation and the like, is modern politics. Thanks to the advent of DNA studies, nationalism has received a fresh and very unhelpful impetus in sticking its nose into archaeology, as various groups try to exploit these remains as supporting evidence for claiming cultural legacy. This image, not created by me, I hasten to point out, points to an attempt to co-opt the Pazirix, the reconstructed face of the Scythian princess here, who are from a long forgotten culture in the identity politics of modern East Asia where the author has put in this picture of a modern Tajik woman to claim that the Tajiks are the linear descendants of these people. The kinds of arguments that these generate are distracting. The creator of the model on the right-hand side, a Russian scientist, claimed confidently that the Ice Maiden is a clear-cut example of the Caucasian race with no typically Mongolian features, while the local archaeologist who worked on the excavation replied, they made the Ice Maiden completely European. So this material is implicated in very contemporary debates. Closer to Greece, though still some hundreds of miles away, a cemetery in Pokrovka in Russia, but right on the, on the border of Kazakhstan, has brought to light in the course of the 1990s and the 2000s, uh, 50, at least 50 burial mounds there were at least 80 women buried here, and 12 of them were buried with grave goods that included swords, daggers, and whetstones. And you can see some of the material that came from one of the assemblages. One of the female skeletons had an arrow head buried in the body cavity, and the bowed legs of another, an adolescent girl, pointed to a life spent on horseback, leading the American uh, excavator to speculate that these and other nomad cultures like it were the historical basis for the Amazon legend. As Herodotus has the Scythian women say, we are riders, our business is with spear and bow. We know nothing of women's work. All right, so at this point,
This is how far we've come. We don't have accurate literary accounts of the nomadic cultures of the steppe. So I can't give you reliable ethnographic reports and certainly nothing generated by these people themselves. We do have reasonable circumstantial evidence that women played a more assertive role in some of these societies than we would expect in sedentary, hierarchically organized states, the ones we're familiar with from the Mediterranean world. And thirdly, that in certain steppe societies, some women may have formed a cadre of warriors riding and fighting like many nomads as mounted archers. However, even if we can see that there is a probable Central Asian background to the Amazon story, and I'm perfectly prepared to concede that, you have to keep in mind a very important principle about historical analysis. Origin is not explanation. We are still a fair distance from the Greeks, and we have not yet considered the Greeks and their interactions with the world of the steppes, and the creation of a specifically Greek Amazon myth. To put the matter quite simply, how do we get from Siberia to Greece? And I don't mean this as a physical phenomenon, presumably you either do it by walking or preferably riding on horseback. I mean, how do we get from the reality of women in the steppe cultures to this Athenian myth? Well, as ever, for the Greeks, we'll start with Homer. In the Iliad, Homer refers to the Amazons twice, describing them with an interesting epithet as Amazones Antianerai. Antianerai is usually translated, well, it's translated in various ways, but the basic meaning seems to be something like Amazons the equal of men. They're comparable. The descriptions in Homer are neither long nor detailed, and it seems that even by the time the poem acquired its monumental form in the 8th or 7th century BC, when they started to write the Iliad down, the Amazons were already familiar to Greek audiences as women warriors. You, you didn't need to spell out who they were. You could make a reference and assume that your audience would say, oh, yeah, okay, the Amazons, right, I get it. It's Herodotus in the 5th century who gives us the fullest account. And this deserves to be cited in full, but time's not going to allow it. So I'm going to give you a paraphrase. And while you might think that my paraphrase is occasionally a little silly, I assure you it really is very much in the spirit of what Herodotus has to say. Once upon a time, when the Greeks were fighting the Amazons, the Greeks defeated the Amazons at the Battle of Thermodon. They rounded up the survivors and put them on three boats, intending to take them home as slaves. On the way back, the women set upon the men and slew them. Being unable to sail, however, they floated about aimlessly until the boats fetched up in the land of the Scythians. The first thing the women found was a herd of horses, which they seized, and started pillaging the Scythian territory. The Scythians, and this is surely the best phrase in Herodotus, quote, could not understand what was going on. <laughs> what to do? They fought the Amazons, they slew some of them, and in stripping the dead, they realized that they were, in fact, women. So, naturally, they, naturally, they selected a band of young men and tasked them with the job of shadowing the Amazons. They were to pitch camp near them and to run away if chased and then pitch their camp again. Second best line in Herodotus. The point of the Scythians' plan was that they wanted to have children by the women. I, I didn't make, I'm not making this up, it's in Herodotus. <laughs> in the strangest courtship scene ever written, ever, book four, chapter 133, because I know you want to go home and read this, <laughs> the boys and the girls started splitting into smaller and smaller groups until there is one Scythian boy left and one Amazon girl left. Love ensues. And each returns to tell the rest of the game. See, I love this story because in most cultures, it's men who can't wait to finish a hookup so they can go to the pub and boast to their mates. But here, the Amazon women do it as well, right? They're just as callow as the men when it comes to casual sex. <laughs> Love and shoes, and each returns to tell the rest of the gang. As word gets out, the number of liaisons increases until 
third best line in Herodotus. When the other young men found out, they joined in and tamed the remaining Amazons. <laughs> now, what I love in this episode is that it has the same elements as the justification of the Wonder Woman story we began with. The women are strong and confident and alluring, but just as important, they are available, and here they have no qualms about utterly promiscuous sex. Never underestimate the power of the heterosexual male to ignore historical facts in favour of pure fantasy. <laughs> in this case, completely forgetting nomadic societies that offer status and respect to women, and instead imagining a society of hot babes. <laughs> My point is that the Herodotine account, if it ever had anything to do with the actual Amazons, has gone off in an entirely different direction. This is like comparing real life behind bars with Orange is the New Black. <laughs> All right, one is real, the other most definitely is not. Women do not spend time behind bars in prison all doing each other's hair. I think, I don't know. <laughs> I'm told. Okay, the story gets even better. We haven't finished with the Herodotus yet, it gets even better. Having realized that they have found the women of their dreams, the young men start living monogamously with their Amazonian partners. But being Scythian, they're actually not very smart. Herodotus says this explicitly. They're not smart enough to learn to talk Amazonian, and they have to wait until the women learn enough Scythian to understand them. The guys basically say, look, we have parents and property back home, so let's go back and join them, and we'll agree to have you as our wives. The women, voicing the concerns of daughters-in-law everywhere, reply, no way, <laughs> because we couldn't get on with the women of your world. We haven't learnt women's work. We shoot arrows, wield javelins, ride horses, while your women just sit in wagons and do women's work. They never go out hunting or anything else. Now, you know, we have a good laugh at this, but I have to tell you, I think this is really fascinating, because what we have here is a male Greek author recounting for us an exchange, almost certainly fictitious, in which the Amazons basically say, conventional women's lives suck. <laughs> How do we suppose a Greek audience responded to this? I think we have to treat this like Greek drama. This is a story that is an example of a safe place for giving expression to ideas which, frankly, are a little dangerous to express openly, and at the same time, transforming this social critique into fantastic ethnography is really like writing science fiction. It creates a distance that renders the critique a little fuzzy, a little less confrontational. In the final phase of the story, the Scythian men briefly return to their families, claim their inheritance, and then go back to their Amazon wives, and once again, the Amazons are the driving force. Let's not stay here, they say. After all, we've done a lot of damage to this land of yours. So they cross the Tanaeus River, travel east for three days, then north for three days, and then in the end come to the land where, according to Herodotus, they now live. He brings it up to the present. And ever since then, he says, the Sauromatian women, for this is what the descendants of the Amazons are called, quote, have kept to their original way of life. They go about hunting on horseback with or without their husbands. They go to war and they wear the same clothes as men do. Herodotus is fascinated by customs. It's what makes him more ethnographer than historian. And his last comments about these people are fascinating. The Sauromatians, he says, speak Scythian, but ungrammatically, as they have always done, because the Amazons never learnt it properly. Right? He's actually using the people that he's interviewed and hearing their, their, their words and saying, you know, these people don't even speak the same language as everyone around them. Why? Well, because their mothers were Amazons and they never really learnt the language. One of their marriage customs, he says, is that no young woman may marry until she's killed a male enemy. Inability to fulfil this condition means that some of them die of old age without ever being married. So, from the 5th century BC, at least, the Greeks were familiar with the Amazons, or at least with stories about the Amazons, and they were interested in their origins, mainly so they could tell lurid stories about them. Herodotus is offering us the fruits of his inquiries, 
asking the questions that presume, excuse me, presumably fascinated and entertained his audience. In fact, in Herodotus' time, in the middle of the 5th century, the Amazons seem to have acquired a particular fascination for the Greeks in general, and the Athenians specifically. Herodotus reports a quarrel on the eve of the Battle of Plataea in 479, when the Tegians and the Athenians had a quarrel as to who should have the uh, honor of commanding the left wing of the Greek forces. The right wing was obviously the Spartans. And in their justification, the Athenians cite three campaigns that have won them renown. Of the third of these, the Athenians say, well, there was the successful campaign of ours against the Amazons when they came from the river Thermodon and invaded Attica. This Amazon invasion of Attica took on such significance for the Athenians that in the official funeral speech given each year in honor of the men who died for Athens, the defeat of the Amazons was an absolutely standard trope. It is as if every July 4th, the president were to give a rousing speech about how we defeated the space aliens. <laughs> Who knows, President Trump's inaugural speech may contain such a... <laughs> Who knows? Come back next year, we'll talk about it. Doesn't matter how often you say it, it still didn't happen. I'm talking now about the Amazon invasion, right? <laughs> Every year, Athenian children heard the story of how their forefathers defeated the Amazons. Sometimes the details varied. In Isocrates' version, the Amazons were totally wiped out. In the 4th century, a local historian named Clytemus gave a different account, according to which Theseus defeated the Amazons, signed a peace treaty with them, and then married their queen, Hippolyta. This is a kinder, gentler treatment of the Amazons. So variation was possible, but in the end, they had to be defeated. Uh, there is unfortunately no 5th century red figure vase, so I'll give you a 21st century red figure comic. That's Theseus running away as the Amazons are chasing him down to the water. Uh, thank God he's got a strategically placed speech bubble, <laughs> and presumably that's Athens right behind him. The location of the Athenian victory is often referred to in the ancient sources as the Amazonion a building or monument not yet securely identified in Athenian topography. That, that's the discovery of the 21st century. If we could find this building, that would be great. Various other graves, grave stelae, and other monuments associated with the Amazons are also referred to in Athenian sources. And it seems that the Athenians believed that there were actual monuments around them in the landscape attesting to the Amazon invasion. You could actually take your kid around and say, look, son, that's where Theseus beat the Amazon queen, right there on that spot. It's been recently suggested by Susan Rotroff and Bob Lamberton, and I think this is a really very plausible argument, that when the Athenians encountered late Mycenaean chamber tombs while digging wells or foundations for later buildings, right, you're in the Agora, in 450 BC, when you're digging down to lay the foundations for a stoa, you're not going down just to empty bedrock, you're going down to Mycenaean chamber tombs. They're littered throughout the Agora. So you're coming down dramatically on the actual evidence for the people who were there before you, hundreds of years earlier. And their argument is, when the Athenians encountered these late Mycenaean chamber tombs while they were digging wells or foundations, they may have been confused by Bronze Age funeral assemblages that mixed weapons and jewelry. Fifth century inhumations were usually single and clearly differentiated by gender. I mean, you could normally say there's one skeleton and it's a guy. Why? Well, he's got a helmet, a shield and so forth. Or it's a woman because she's got spindle whorls and she's got beads. But these chamber tombs have multiple burials and they mix up the assemblages. So their argument is that these chamber tombs, possessing the skeletons of men and women with swords and beads, might easily have been confused for Amazon tombs associated with the defeated invaders. In addition, Theseus had taken an Amazon wife, and Plutarch, Plato, and Pausanias all refer to her monument as either a memorial or a stele. Pardon me, Rotroff again notes that a bell crater by the Eupolis painter seems to depict a mourning Amazon with a horse right next to what looks very much like a funeral stele. 
that's a funeral marker, quite possibly. And she associates this with a memorial to the dead Amazon queen, as if the warrior and horse were felt to remain numinously close to the actual spot where she was buried in Attic soil. This is very exciting, because it may well mean then that the Athenians used the Amazon story as a way of interpreting the tangible past, the actual bones and pots and material that cropped up, shaping the random artifacts they encountered into a coherent narrative. This was useful not only because it helped the Athenians make sense of their distant past, but also because the Amazon story provided a nice analogue for an actual, real, recent invasion, the Persian invasion. The two went hand in hand, Amazon, Persian, invasion, invasion, myth, history. And on the north side of the Agora, the Athenians in the 5th century erected a multi-purpose building, the Stoa Poikile, the painted stoa, is what that means, that became famous for its two monumental paintings. Guess what they are? The defeat of the Amazons, the defeat of the Persians. So again, every day in the Agora, you could walk into this wonderful building. This is the stoa from which Stoic philosophy takes its name. This is where Zeno used to give his lectures. So you could go to the stoa and what you saw were two monumental paintings that juxtaposed the Amazon invasion and the Persian invasion. So generations of Athenians grow up seeing the one as the mythological analogue for the other historical event, or as they would probably put it, the early history and the recent history. The paintings, of course, don't survive, but a lengthy description by Pausanias in the second century allowed a 19th century scholar, Carl Robert, to reconstruct it like this. And his use of contemporary artifacts such as vase painting makes it a fairly reliable guide to the ancient painting. And as you look at it, I'm, I'm not sure how clearly you can see this, but let me point out, where you've got figures that are carrying round shields and have crested helmets, these are Greeks, that's a hoplite, because he's carrying a hoplon. Here's another hoplite with a hoplon, and there's his shield. And he's wearing a cuirass, and they have their spears. But you'll also see, and I'll show you this in more detail in a minute, there are a lot of figures like this, who are wearing striped pajamas, here, with nice soft felt hats and animal skins, trousers, bows and arrows, bows and arrows, and light wicker shields, in contrast to the Greeks advancing from here, either as hoplites in armor or these troops who are heroically naked. As you look at it, I urge you to notice the posture and the garb of the Persians. Notice the way they wear brightly patterned garments, especially trousers, and this distinguishes the Persians from the Greeks. This is how Persians are often depicted on Greek vases. And then notice the depiction of Amazons in contemporary 5th century vases, wearing striped and patterned garments, and trousers, and soft hats, and wicker shields, and more soft hats, and more trousers. Persians and Amazons look the same in 5th century art. <coughs> Greek or Persian or Amazon? Well, not a Greek, but with trousers, probably an Amazon. And this is my favourite one. Look at these lovely soft garments with the patterns here. Some people have also suggested that these may be artistic representations of the tattoos that were known to be worn, as for example by the Pazaric princess. But in many cases, you can actually see the bottom of the garment, so I'm not going to press that. But notice the patterns here and the trousers, the soft garments, the round, uh, the, sorry, the, um, um, the crescent-shaped wicker shield, uh, lack of helmet, in this case, fighting with a rock in this instance. I mean, the girls have got their hair nicely done up, so, you know, the chignon will keep the hair out of their face while they're fighting. And then over here, the hoplite shield, the crested helmet, it's Greeks versus Amazons. Or again here with trousers, patterned garment, and again armoured with bow and sword. As you can see from many examples like this, and there are many more, the figure of the Persian and the figure of the Amazon are basically interchangeable. 
Scholars who study Athenian iconography make the point that many of the depictions of Greek versus Persian, what we find in these is an elevation uh, of the Greek to heroic status. Naked means heroic, even though no Greek ever went intentionally into battle without armor. Similarly, the opposite of the heroic naked male Greek is the soft trouser-wearing Persian. And the culmination of this process is the rendering of the soft Persian as the victim of the masculine Greek. Here, for example, on the Eurymedon vase, which I've shown some of you in an earlier, <coughs> oh wait, it gets worse. <laughs> because the Persian here is about to be attacked by this guy. A naked Greek holding his block and tackle and charging around the vessel about, frankly, to bugger the Persian. <laughs> and in case, in case you know, people don't get the message, look, I'm sorry, I hope this is not too over the top, but I mean, the message for the Greeks is very clear because the inscription on the vessel actually says, I am Eurymedon, and Eurymedon was the battle in about 468 when the Greeks finally drove the Persians entirely out of their gene and established essentially a border for all naval activity beyond which the Persians never again passed. This is like having a vessel that says on it, I am Iwo Jima. This is a reference that everyone in the 5th century gets. Oh yeah, we gave it to the Persians all right. So here, the Greek is essentially doing to the Persian exactly the same thing that Scythians and Theseus do to the Amazons. They tame them, quite simply, by penetration. In the 5th century, gender politics in relation to women and cultural politics in relation to Persians map onto each other, and the Amazons become a useful signifier and what they signified was the potential threat to the natural order. If there are Amazons, we must be men. They are like the war on drugs. They exist to give our actions meaning. Inevitably, because they are figures in a narrative, the Amazons increasingly generated individual figures who interacted with Greek heroes. By the 5th century, the general story of the Amazons and the specific tales of their leading heroines, namely Penthesilea and Hippolyta, were becoming uh, quite widespread. I'm just going to try and... Sorry, skip down if I can get my technology to work. Stories and... Paintings such as this, vase paintings, situate Penthesilea, the Amazon queen, in the Trojan War narrative and thereby place the Amazons in the wider circle of Greek storytelling. In the stories told after Homer that elaborated on the Trojan War, a popular episode was the battle between Achilles and Penthesilea, the Amazon queen, and when he lifts her helmet, he realizes it is a woman, falls in love with her as she dies in his arms. And in the manner of these post-Homeric elaborations, that story too then gets more elaborated. This is not in Homer. This is all post-Homer. In one of the other versions, Thersites sees Achilles weeping, mocks him, and is in turn promptly slaughtered. So these stories grew and multiplied in poetry and in painting. Time and again, the stories revolve around the central idea of women outside the bounds of Greek society, eventually being tamed, brought around, socialized to appropriate modes of Greek behavior, usually as wives. According, excuse me, accordingly, when some scholars like Adrian Mayer argue that the Amazon myth expresses a fundamental yearning for equality and gender harmony, which is pretty much at odds with the usual view of the Greek family, my reply would be that the Amazons are subversive in exactly the same way as Mulan is, subs is subversive. Yeah, it's radical that a girl defends her family's honor by passing as a man and saving China from the Hun. So radical that she comes home, makes goo-goo eyes at the hunk whom she will marry. Order is restored, 
Harmony is victorious and Mulan ends up in a dress. So the story has the potential to be subversive, but it undercuts that very potential. The people of antiquity were not stupid, and the urge to tell wonderful stories about the Amazons often conflicted with a tendency to dismiss these as just that, stories. And so in this last segment, I want to finish by looking at Amazon skepticism. And once again, I think we can learn a great deal by avoiding oversimplification. In the first century BC, a historian by the name of Diodorus Siculus wrote about Penthesilea, the queen of the Amazons, as if he were describing an historical character. For a few years after the campaign of Heracles against the Amazons, during the time of the Trojan War, they say, Penthesilea, the queen of the surviving Amazons, who was a daughter of Ares and had slain one of her, her kindred, fled from her native land because of the sacrilege. And fighting as an ally of the Trojans after the death of Hector, she slew many of the Greeks, and after gaining distinction in the struggle, she ended her life heroically at the hands of Achilles. Now, they say that Penthesilea was the last of the Amazons to win distinction for bravery, and that for the future, the race diminished more and more and then lost all its strength. Consequently, in later times, whenever any writers recount their prowess, men consider the ancient stories about the Amazons to be fictitious tales. Now, what we can see here is that after Homer, the story of the Amazons of Troy became much more elaborate. These post-Homeric stories grew, in part, out of people's desire to know and hear more about their favorite Homeric episodes. So this tells us that the Amazons were a popular motif. People were asking the poets, tell us more, we want to know more. Second, you'll notice that the romantic element has, has begun to dominate. So we begin to move away from the epic to the personal. And you'll see that there were simply those who said, these are fictitious tales. And even a believer like Diodorus has to account for this, which he does by saying, Penthesilea was the last truly great Amazon. And after that, decline. In effect, Diodorus sees the world in the first century BC as having simply become less heroic. So the Amazons will continue to exist for him as part of a better world, or to quote Tennyson, that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. In the post-classical world, the Amazons continue to ride and whoop and shoot their arrows and fall in love with young men and be tamed by them because they become the stuff of nostalgia. Regardless of any message they convey as symbols of independent women or proto-feminism, they become part of the cultural stock of the Greeks, cropping up in Amazonomachies, as here in the metopes of the Temple of Apollo at Bassae, in places that have no conceivable connection to the Amazons. It comes as no surprise, therefore, that when a Greek actually traveled farther than any before him into those semi-mythical regions of Scythia, that he should collide with the Amazons. The Greek is Alexander, and according to the Alexander Romance, the queen of the Amazons, Thalestris, wrote to him with a proposal that she and 300 of her warrior maidens should visit him and together conceive a new generation of eugenically designed super warriors. <laughs> What's fascinating is that Alexander historians in antiquity were absolutely evenly split. I mean, mathematically, it is down the center between those who regarded that story as complete fantasy and those who said it actually happened. One of the ones who did say that it actually happened was a man called Onesocritus, who was with Alexander on the campaign. And years later, he wrote about the visit of Thalestris. At a reading of his work, King Lysimachus, who also had been on the expedition as a young man, listened patiently and then asked Riley, and where was I at the time? <laughs> but even when people couldn't quite bring themselves to believe in Amazons, they also couldn't quite not believe in Amazons. 
Arian, writing 500 years after Alexander, was something of a skeptic, but notice that when he recounts the story of Alexander's meeting with the Amazons, he gives as his personal opinion, I doubt if the Amazons still existed at this time, meaning that they had existed at one time, and when he tries to give what we would call a rationalizing explanation of how a bunch of female warriors turned up in the Macedonian camp, he says, if Atropates really did present some female cavalry troops to Alexander, I should imagine that they must have been women of some nationality or other who'd been taught to ride and equipped in the traditional Amazonian style. Because, of course, everyone would have recognized what traditional Amazonian style was. As with much of the ancient world, the medieval inheritance was based as much on fantasy as reality. With Alexander and Thalestris here, for example, looking very much like courtier, uh, courtiers from the court of the Valois Dukes of Burgundy in the late 1400s, which, coincidentally, is where this manuscript was created. <laughs> the takeaway from that, however, along with the rest of what I've been saying tonight, is very simple and that is that every generation gets the Amazon that it deserves. Thank you. Uh, I think it's question time, and I think I'm running it from up here. So if anyone has anything critical or whatever, leave. And if anyone has anything positive, please take the microphone. Anthony has one back there. And is there one on the other side too, Anthony? Just the one over there. So flap your arms about. Very enjoyable, thank you. Thank I you. seem to remember in my freshman university course in Western civilization that the Isle of Lesbos off the Turkish coast uh, played some role in the myth of the Amazons. Uh, am I not remembering correctly? I'm wondering whether you're mixing it up with Lemnos a little further north, unless you're thinking about the fact that in much later authors um, there is a suggestion that this is an all-female society and that, of course, then gets slightly mapped onto the reputation of Lesbos as an island of lesbians, yeah. um, which really goes back to the poetry of Sappho. Um, there are a lot of very tenuous and uh, connections being drawn there that aren't in any way really verifiable. The reason why I'm raising Lemnos, which of course sounds very much like Lesbos, is that it is an island that has some separate traditions involving uh, female society. The Lemnian women um, slaughter all of their husbands after they come back from the mainland, um, having brought back slaves and children who they fathered by them, and they're punished by having a, a, a pestilence that afflicts them so that they, they smell hideous. And uh, there are a bunch of stories, I'm actually trying to work through these right now to work out what the associations are. I think it's to do with the fact it's a volcanic island. But uh, it, th these are all slightly separate, Lemnos, Lesbos, and the, uh, the Amazons. The Amazons are normally placed further uh, north. The Miskra, when it's actually given a real location, is on the southern coast of the Black Sea, okay. rather than in the Aegean. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, fascinating talk. I hope this isn't too trivial, but I said, thank you, fascinating talk. I hope this isn't too trivial, but where does the name come from? Oh, well, the reason I didn't go into that is because um, that's a lecture on its own, but let me just v give you very briefly. The Greek interpretation of the name is that it comes from ah madzdon, madzdon being related to the Greek word for breast, and the alpha at the beginning being what the Greeks call the alpha privative, which means non-breast. And the story that's told of this, th these are false etymologies, and they're very popular in the Greek world. And th this etymology is, oh, the Amazons have no breast because they cut off their breast so they could fire their arrows. Now, that's the story that's told. The reason why I didn't go into it is um, some scholars working on the whole Amazon issue recently um, have pointed out that's actually not very widespread in the Greek literary sources. 
it's a, it's a late explanation. Secondly, it's one that is palpably ridiculous. If you've ever seen a woman firing a, a bow and arrow, you don't need to cut off a breast to do it, <laughs> right? And um, there are uh, no depictions in the vases that I showed you, uh, particularly the one from uh, the mausoleum, the, uh, the relief sculpture that showed the Greek fighting, the woman whose dress came open at the side. Well, you can see a breast. That's how you mark her out as a woman in that statue. So um, this idea of their being breastless because of their having to fire bows and arrows is a, is a very minor opinion that isn't picked up in, in most of the literary sources and not in the artistic sources at all. The, uh, those who play with um, the etymology of Greek words, um, words that come to us through Greek, have argued that there are about three or four different possibilities for this. They've related it in some cases to Hittite and in particular to Proto-Indo-European where um, there are words that may mean something like a uh, warrior that may be connected to it. The, the, the story that Herodotus gives is actually unrelated to this altogether. He says the word for them in, Thrace, in um, Scythian is um, oyor pata. And he says it's a word that means oyor, man, pata, kill. <laughs> um, whether Herodotus spoke Scythian is not entirely clear at all, but that's again one of those sort of easy etymologies. But yeah, there, there are a number of different possibilities about where the word comes from, depending upon which language you think it comes from. But uh, I think they're all pretty unreliable, to tell the truth. Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if this is relevant. It's kind of a follow-up, I guess, because it's about the name. Is there a connection also to the... Uh, South American rainforest uh, and where that name came from. And well, that name was drawn from uh, the Greek and applied later on, but it doesn't help us understand the origins because it's a, it's a second order development. It doesn't have anything to do with the people who gave it that name. It doesn't have anything to do with the Amazon myth. Uh, I'm sure it does, but I'm certainly not an expert on the colonial um, nomenclature of uh, South America. I'm sorry, but I, I, I've I've just always assumed that that was the Spanish who gave it that name. I don't think it's a, in any, in any sense an indigenous name. I could be wrong. If anyone knows the answer, I'm not in any sense an expert on that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you need to come to the microphone. I'm sorry. There you go. Thanks. Oh, he said there were women fighters that the Spanish encountered and they called them Amazons. So yes, it's an application of the Greek term. I mean, don't forget everyone in, in, in colonial times who was from an elite was trained in Greek and Latin. They knew this material like the back of their hand. So um, it's not at all surprising that they would apply these terms across. This may be mixing sixes and sevens, but is there any correspondence between the training of Spartan women and the, and the traditions or the myths of the Amazons? No, there isn't. That's a very interesting question. Um, Spartan women are certainly trained in athletics, but they're not trained in um, techniques of warfare. They're not trained as either sword fighters or spear fighters or bow women. They're trained as athletes to compete in the games of Hera at Olympia. The, the women that we do hear of in the Greek world who are given military training um, are very, very few and far between. We know of it happening in Macedon, the wife of Philip III, who was Alexander's half-brother and who was buried with him at Vergina, was trained as a bow woman. But it's very, very rare, and it's not systematic in Sparta at all. That's not part of what is the training of Spartan women. Thank you. Thank you, linesmen. Thank you, ball boys. We're done.